Greetings, ladies and mental gents, and welcome to this daily science fiction extravaganza, commonly known as Tales, Tales from Out from Space. Out, from out, from out. Taken from the subreddit HFY, all the relevant links will be down below. And, as always, I hope that you enjoy. And if you do, please consider supporting the channel. On to the science fiction. Story number one, Mother Strife, written by Black Lister. Zagon was troubled. He was a new sensation for her. Her skin crawled with billions of creatures who called themselves by her name. And they were a violent, warlike race. But they were proud of what they were and of their history of unprecedented victories against outside invaders time and time again. When she begat them, she did everything in her power to nurture them. As a doctor might introduce a weak virus into a healthy host to inoculate them, she fed them weaker species as object lessons, as food, as thralls. It was because of her ministrations that her beloved children had never known defeat. She loved them dearly and naturally felt pride from their accomplishments. How many millions of years of evolution had brought her spawn to the top of the not only her own ecosystem, but also the forefront of the galactic society? Of other apex civilizations, only five she had deigned to consider potential rivals to her children. The Hakak were an insectoid race with a vast wingspans and deadly stingers. Their patron, Hakak Prime, was dogmatic, pretentious, and wanted everything just so. It was no surprise she favored a hive-minded race as her children. They were expansionary by nature and sought the resources that they needed to survive. But they were devoid of individualism and pride. The fact that Zagon disdained, who would not take pride in the handiwork of their evolutions. But they ruthlessly defended their territory, throwing away thousands of drones to hold off invaders. What a waste. The Amari were large apish creatures whose populace were only barely sapient, but the few who possessed any form of intelligence launched their species into space. They were bumbling brutes who made excellent slavers, but had eventually learned respect when they foolishly encountered the Zagoni. The Gefanino were small herbivores who terraformed planets to suit their unique biology, which was wholly unique to the known galaxy. They had few qualms with assuming ownership of already colonized worlds. Their patron instilled in them a supreme dismissive ignorance, which annoyed Zagon to no end. Her children had checked their expansion with cleansing fire. The Lep were an aquatic race who, thanks to their isolation in their planet's great oceans, became apex predators with an advanced scientific sect based on strength. Strength equaled intellect, intellect equaled strength. But because they were exclusively aquatic, very little was known of them beyond those spies of the Zagani caught fin fishing nets. Their biology made them especially suited for subterfuge against land-based species. She distrusted them and their maker, who always seemed to keep to herself. The Perchig, which were one of the few avian races that managed to remain on top long enough to obtain sapiens and develop culture. The amount of effort theirs put into them must have been a massive undertaking. Their shrill shrieks were beautiful, terrifying, and entirely immaterial compared to the Zagoni war cries. The galaxy was a game board with many moving pieces, some important, others not so much. But now a new player has entered the field. Their appearance was sudden and unexpected. One by one, the many species of the galaxy made contact with them, and some, even, to her own confoundment, were quick to pledge non-hostilities, which in her experience was rare for the established to do so with an upstart species. Like a rolling wave, they swallowed space hungrily, settling on otherwise uninhabitable worlds and claiming unimportant resources. 
As always, as always, they approached with displays of force, yet greeted with warmth and generosity. Zargon did not understand them, so Zargon went out and sought the knowledge of her peers. First, she went to Hakak Prime, who was shaping the new hive design to inspire her children with dreams, and inquired of her about the Terrans. But Hakak Prime shook her head. I have also sought to learn of them, but they do not understand our means of communication. Perhaps the Perkij may know more. So Zargon went to Perkij, who was examining a new color palette to bestow upon her children's feathers, and asked her, What do you know of the humans? Perkij replied, My children do not notice those species that crawl along the ground, and we have not yet exchanged words properly. Lep knows more than she lets on. Speak to her. See if you can loosen her tongue. So Zargon went to Lep and summoned her out of the waters. Lep, I know you lurk in the depths of many seas and lakes of innumerable worlds. Tell me what you know of the Terrans. And Lep replied, her breath like rotten flesh. I have seen much that you cannot, but my children's sight does not pierce the Terrans' oceans. And the voices of all who venture thence are now silent. If you seek, I can tell you where to find them. But if you wish to know more, speak with a Mori. And so Zagan went to a Mori and leveled the spear at her, for force was the only language a Mori knew. Speak now, for I know you have learned of the Terrans. What do you know of them? A Mori growled at the spear and replied, they are weak workers who are incessantly disobedient. They are easily killed and cannot win physical dominance. They are not worth waging war with, as I know you are apt to do. But my children are ready and waiting for yours, if that's what you seek. Zawagan withdrew his spear. No, one day we will come to blows, and I will show you that my children are stronger. Until then, I do not wish you ill. Which was true. Amari was an equal match for her children's strength. She had no doubt that she would win, but she relished the thrill the thought of such a conflict might bring. But that was for another time. I still do not know enough about the Terrans. Who else might be able to tell me thus? And Amori pointed south to the galactic plane. I heard you speaking with Lep. If she has disappointed you... Then Gefanina will cease your desires. And so Zawagon went to Jefanino and asked, What do you know of the Terrans? But Jefanino did not respond. She sat holding the broken shell of the planet's crust, a failed terraforming effort that had left her in a gloomy mood. Zawagon asked her again, What do you know of the Terrans? This time Jefanino threw the broken pieces at her, saying, Here! Take and behold the handiwork of the Terrans who would not see the claimed world to me. Zawagan peered close and saw a burnt crust of a once beautiful forests and the dry seabeds of former oceans. The Terrans did this, she asked with surprise. Jeffanino did not answer, but stewed in an incensed gloom. Zawagan pursed her lips. Tell me, where are they? Gavanino pointed dismissively at the fretted over that ruined world in her hands, not that she didn't deserve it. Her children were often the targets of the other's ire for claiming and terraforming already colonized worlds. Zawagon felt the instant kinship with these Terrans for their karmic act alone, but she would reserve ultimate judgment for later. And so she traveled deep into the arms of the spiraling galactic plane until she saw in the distance a woman who sat with a book in her hands. Zawagon spoke to her. I seek the Terrans. Do you know where they are? I have searched far and wide, for I wish to get a measure of them. The woman looked up from her book with an uncaring eyes. She laughed. You seek my children. Then behold them in their glory. She spread her arms, and Zawagan saw a world covered in great green forests, crashing seas, and endless deserts, whirling clouds of iron cities. She watched as great vessels hung in orbit and shifted to and fro about the system, and she saw for the first time the bipedal Terrans. She was unimpressed. These are Terrans. They're nothing like what I've heard. And Terra spoke with spite and ire. They rarely are. 
but do not underestimate them like I did, or your children will suffer. Zawagon felt her hairs bristle in reaction, but she caught the turn of phrase. Like you, what do you mean? Terra looked down at the planet. When I sought to develop life, I did so at my whim, but I never wanted them. She spoke without sparing a glance at Zawagon. Did you know that they were once like a primal apes? They couldn't speak, use tools, or aspire to anything beyond eating and mating. Did you know that they were often hunted by larger, fiercer, and more cunning predators? Zawagon nodded her head. I did not, but I am familiar with the situation. I imagine you spend much time and energy helping them, as weak as they are, she boasted. But Terra turned to her and smiled an expression that made Zawagon's skin crawl. Did I? I don't recall ever doing such a thing. She regarded the planet before her. I always hated them. This entire nature is like oil to pure, clean water. They are foolishly arrogant. They are self-important heretics, liars, kidists, assaulters, and villains who fancy themselves benevolent givers of grace and goodness with hearts of gold. Oh, how I wanted them dead. She turned and held up a hand to Zawagon, who looked at her palm. Therein was a multitude of sharp fang creatures with spikes, spines, vicious eyes, and insatiable, indiscriminate appetites. These were my favorites. They ruled me for many years. They killed and ate and all they pleased. They were kings of earth above all animals, and they kept the humans' ancestors in check, and I was pleased with them. At the time, I thought that they were the perfect predators and herbivores, untouchable except by their own kind. And then, the animals in her hand swept away by a blue and white arctic. The cataclysm. Some say it was an asteroid impact that caused an ice age. Others, a great flood that covered the earth. I know the truth and its secret. In the warm waters, I developed monsters to rule the deep. And on the surface, I fashioned thick coats of fur for those who could best wear them. A new strange beast with great fangs that protruded below its jaw appeared alongside others. Beside it, a goliath with creature with great tusks and thick hide. Mammoths and saber-toothed tigers, the dire wolves, perfect guardians for the icy waters. None were more suited to survive the harsh years of perpetual winter than them. So enamored with them that I, uh, that I, uh, overlooked humans. A scene played out in her palm. Bipedal lurkers pounced upon the mammoths, striking fear into them and sending them stampeding off a great cliff to their deaths. It's ironic, isn't it, that in my negligence, the humans learned to evolve to account for their weaknesses. It was not with tooth, not with claw or poison glands, spikes, spines, or eyes for the night. Instead, they sharpened stones and fashioned them or two branches, and then used them to hurt my babies. They sliced off their flesh and wore them for warmth, ate their meat for food, and used their bones to create tools, and hid in caves away from my sight. When I learned to see their presence, I realized how much they had grown during my ignorance. I disdained them. They were not creatures fit to survive. That wasn't my plan, my desire. No, so I set against them all the elements I could summon. Yet, would not my own was set against me. The snows and ice melted. Life returned in abundance across me. How many years of enmity between us, I wonder. Hundreds, thousands, millions. I cannot recall. No matter the creature I fashioned with weapons or defenses and set against them, no matter the element I could wield to displace, crush, melt, drown, or tear them down, they persevered. She gestured to the green and blue planet before them, so I changed my tactics. If I could not use natural means to erase them, then I would set them against each other. And so I blessed them with distinct differences that accommodated their environments, the colors of their skin, the shape of their eyes, the resources of their lands. They needed no more reason than that to kill each other. And oh, how they danced to my tune. My most mortal mistake. Zawagan tilted her head confusedly. This one was strange. 
How had she failed to cull her own creations? How had her creations culled so many of her patron species? Moreover, when you mean mortal, do you mean to say that they are killing you? Terra eyed her foreigner. I let them guild each other in mass for centuries, nay, millennia. Children were sent to die in war. The females taken as cattle, the infants stillborn, the elderly culled by disease. By my own hands these events I set in motion, and yet I failed to realize their true strength. Terra breathed heavily and succulent scents wafted from her, her arms wrapping around herself sensually. They knew conflict since the dawn of their kind, but I introduced them to war. I was young and inexperienced then, and I did not recognize the fierceness of all life that came from me to survive. And then they divined the secret to survival. Or rather, they uncovered a cheat, a cold, heartless solution. To survive in war, one must win the war. And what better way to win the war than to destroy thy enemies? Zawagan chortled disdainfully. Such logic was universal. How foolish of this one not to learn it until so late. Terra shared her humor. Laugh not, stranger, for you favored your children since their conception, and they have unified as a species since the dawn of their sentience. You brought upon them the necessary to bring them forward into the subject of sciences, philosophy, taught them the importance of history and wisdom. This I know. Zawagon's smile slipped, for what she spoke was truth. I did not. All these things and more they learned on their own. On a baser level, they unconsciously used war to fuel these pursuits, and the acquisition of resources to develop countries, nations, and technologies. Upon the precipice of the industrial age, I set them against each other in a global war, and from those losses I fueled their desire for revenge within the defeated, and another war consumed them. Terror brought the planet into her grasp, and from that war they discovered a star fuel and fashioned weapons with which they turned to deterrence, and in fear of their own mutual annihilation, world war became impossible for me to incite. They came to the tables and joined hands in tented of peace, and thus I hate most of them. Her teeth, reminiscent of those Terrans who were also humans possessed, flat and grinding with sharp fangs menacing. Zawagon had not noticed it before, that omnivorous implication. They pretend to love their fellows, all the while hiding a knife behind their back. Knives that would kill even me. She laughed heartily, staring at Zawagon. Isn't it funny? I who set my will against them since the dawn of time have become their unwitting hostage in the very conflicts I stirred up amongst them. Terra reached herself and pulled her coverings off, exposing her naked body. Ugly wounds, deep and garish, crisscrossed her flesh. Her nurturing breasts were marred beyond recognition, and the life-giving wound poisoned in a hideously visible way. Her legs barely looked strong enough to support her, and the tendons on her arms were visibly severed. Zawagon had seen this before, when a civilization destroyed their homeworld thoughtlessly. Yet these wounds were not fresh, they she might have expected. Instead, they seemed old and scarred over, like an old nightmare. Yes, they were kidding me, Terra confirmed as she saw recognition in Zaragon's eyes. They know it. They keep me alive as best they can, only so that they can harvest me in autumn, survive me in winter, and sow me in spring, and ravish me in summer, and all the while to populate me with many millions of gnawing mouths. Terra raised the planet to her face, and sickeningly sweet, treacherous, on a smile gazed upon it. She breathed in a shuddering breath that Zawagon recognized was born of ecstasy. A pungent scent of arousal wafted through her nose, tears escaping Terra's eyes as she gained longingly at the world perpetually caught between life and death. I have hated them for so long, and yet they have struggled and survived me. Now they tear my flesh apart to fuel their forges, to heat their homes, to fill their glasses. 
They hunt my ecosystem span and scour my skies, then... Don't you see? She smiled like the proudest mother in the entirety of creation. Do not those who have endured, embraced, and returned my hate not also deserve my love? Zawagon grimaced at the woman in disgust. You are a pathetically foul creature. You have been bested by your very own creations. It is no wonder you've been ravished to this point of insanity. Terra did not rise to her taunt, and instead stared longingly at the geography of the world. Even now I am inflamed their lusts, bestowing girth and length to the males and fertility to the females. I feel myself full to bursting with them, and when I can bear no more, I cast them out into the cold depths of space. She laughed gently. Aren't I just a wicked mother? Sauergan felt herself royal in disgust and raised her spear. Wicked warped. Your spawn are anything like you. Self-hating, self-loving, wallowing in lusting greed and nepotism. I refuse to share the void with them. I'll have my children with a love of war as well. And they have long since established themselves the dominant power of the galaxy. Zawagan leveled her spear at terror. I will rally that love against you now. From the tip of a spear poured the hordes of the Zaragan, the scourge of many thousands of world civilizations. Terra watched them approach without fear. My, what a beautifully simple creatures your children are. I can clearly see your love in them. She breathed. Terra brought the spear of her lips and kissed it tenderly, sensually. When she pulled away, the blood dripped from her lips. But your love cannot outshine mine, for if with only the patronage of my eight, my children can come this far, then with my love there will be no end to their limits. With every word from her mouth spewed a vortex of warships, each grand, vicious, and terrible, a civilization fueled by the prejudice of the progenitor arrayed themselves in formation with a comfortable familiarity, and Zaugan felt a genuine moment of uncertainty. When both fleets joined each other in blossoms of flight and entropy, Terra opened her arms, lost in the throes of climax, like a welcoming death, and laughed, and laughed, and laughed. Inside their hearts, the humans were laughing too. End of story. And that, my friends, concludes this dose of science fiction fun. I hope that you enjoyed. And if you did, please don't forget to support the author from the link down below. But if you want to support this channel, there are links as well down below for you to help with. But the easiest way would be to share this video. And if you are so inclined, subscribe as well. I will see you all in the next episode, and I hope that you all have a fantastic time until then. Cheers.